Right, welcome back. Lin here again. I'm a doctoral student from UNC SEALS, and this is the fifth and last lesson on the basics of library and information science. Since you are here, I will assume that you have now learned the basic terms and know who is who in the field. But once again, these are just brief introductions, and you will find semester long classes discussing one or more of these topics in more depth. So, what do we do for last class? Well, first thing first, Please give yourself some, clap, some claps and pat yourself on the back. It's great that you have made it so far. As promised last time, in the last lesson, we will wrap up theories and methods you've learned over the course and discuss how to put thoughts into action. I have said that an important goal of this lesson is to give you some foundations to redesign or at least reimagine information systems that are not working in your life. That is, to me, a very basic promise and li of library and information science, or really any kind of professional field. Knowing a field systemically allows you to think both imaginatively and practically, so you can create something different but also useful. With that said, what I'm going to say next is not to throw waters onto that promise, but to really think about what follows the design. So from my own outsider's perspective, United States and first world countries already have too many designers and too little doers. Design, design methods, design thinking, brainstorming, etc., etc., are sometimes inflated. People generate ideas but don't take the responsibility to carry things out. In corporates and in other institutions, you could encounter people throwing out whims and random ideas in meetings and believing they are valuable designs. Ideation and intellectual properties are these expensive, highly valued labors, while execution and actual production are trivialized and outsourced labors. And on top of that, you also have so many people in highly privileged positions doing the design work. So their choices are unhelpful, if not harmful, for people without their privilege. These are real problems with design works, and we need to be well aware of that. Here's a quick comparison to demonstrate that point. If you have ever run across some basic design classes, you probably have seen this very simple design lifecycle model. At the first glance, this makes total sense. You come up with ideas, you narrow down and define your problem, you make design drafts, build the product, test it out, and launch the newly designed product into the real world. And you do this iteratively, in cycles. This is sort of true of the design process, but it really misses out the amount of details, labors, and knowledges you actually need in each of the stages. If you work with this model, you may seriously underestimate how many hours of work goes behind, say, the word build or test. On the other hand, maybe let's look at this web page design lifecycle, or maybe this product lifecycle. Can you spot the differences? Well, here you can see you will deal with much more specific actions like content writing, coding, search engine optimization, website promotion, code and content maintenance, or on the product side, supply chain, manufacturing, warehouse, logistics, sales, and after sales, recycle and disposal, etc., etc., etc. You may think a lot of these details are not as creative or innovative, but as we have seen over this course, they are hands-on knowledges and labors that make things work in the first place. Creativity originates exactly from these mundane things. So how can information science help to make good designs? So far in this lesson, we have covered a lot of the analytical, technical, and the critical frameworks from information science research. Yep. Those are respectively the contents of the last three classes. Analytical frameworks help us understand what conceptually and philosophically makes up information objects and systems. Technical frameworks gives us practical tools to evaluate how well they work. And critical frameworks contextualize systems and allows us to see how they impact people's lives. These frameworks can help us connect all the different aspects and concerns of design. So let's not stop at naive ideas. Let's really analyze our ideas, speak the specific languages, and put them into perspectives. Let's turn them into reality and think about how to sustain the work in the long run. To be more precise, here I want to discuss two actionable design tools, prototyping and heuristics. So first I want to talk about prototyping. Prototyping as a design tool bridges the gap between concepts and reality. It's a hands-on trial and error stage between design drafts and full production. In industrial design, prototypes are the models and samples made in design labs and studios 
before things are sent to the manufacturer. In software development, prototyping lies between ideation and coding. It is working with some real limits in computer programming, but it has no codes in it. A well-made prototype will translate user interface designs on paper into a precise interactive model only without actual codes. These prototypes serve a lot of functions. Designers can show them on company meetings and gather internal feedbacks, and they can also recruit small groups of ordinary users as testers. These testers will try out the prototypes and give feedbacks on the interaction flows, interface layouts, and or graphic design styles. Once a software prototype gets through this testing and evaluating process, programmers can then take the prototype, get all the design specs from it, and implement in actual coding environment. Of course, programmers will do further testing and evaluation on the coded program to make sure it actually works, and design changes may go back and forth during this process. After all of that, the team can deliver the newly designed program based on the prototype to its real-world users. There are different levels of pro prototyping as well, low fidelity, medium fidelity, and high fidelity. On the low fidelity side, a design made with moving paper pieces can also serve as a prototype. Medium fidelity prototypes are usually wireframe designs. They give you a sense of which component goes where on the screen, and you can specify user interactions like clicking on this button will show you this screen. High fidelity prototypes are very near the end of the design process, and they show the screen almost like it is finished. Each level of prototyping has its own strengths and disadvantages, so they are good for different stages of development. Low fidelity paper prototypes are easy to change and they are pretty tactile, helpful for early ideation. Medium fidelity wireframes are closer to real programs while still being flexible enough, good for user testing. High fidelity prototypes can help with graphic design choices and they look very good for presentation. But if you recruit testers and show them a very polished high fidelity prototype, they may think your design is already set in stone and there's nothing they can change about. For software programming, there are lots of prototyping tools out there, but their basic logic is pretty much the same. You drag and drop images, text, and graphic components onto a canvas and design your own screen. Then you draw out the interactive areas and define how user interactions will lead users from one screen to the next. It's much like slideshows or presses, but with more precision and more interactive functions. As for the prototyping tools, Figma is a big one out there right now. It has a thriving community, creating lots of templates and graphic assets. It's good for high fidelity prototyping and graphic designs, and it's pretty fun to work with. Similar to Figma, you have Adobe XD, which I'm not sure if Adobe is already sunsetting because Adobe is already trying to acquire Figma. Um, Adobe XD, as I'm recording this, is no longer available for purchases as an individual app but it still comes as part of their Creative Cloud plan. Um, Balsamic, this is another well-established tool in UI UX design profession, and it's focused on mid fidelity wireframe prototyping. It's in my opinion easier to use than Figma or XD because all the components are pre-made and you can drag and drop in a PowerPoint-like environment. And again, mid fidelity front wireframes are usually the best for testing. And finally, Pencil is kind of like an open source free alternative to Balsamic, and I've seen quite a lot of researchers using it. Oh, as academic researchers, we usually love open source stuff more than commercial products. That's just the ethics of our work. So that is about prototyping. Now let's talk about the other design tool, Heuristics. Heuristics is about how to evaluate design. Of course, the information science frameworks are already doing this, especially for the big why and for whom questions, but how do we make them more useful in practical situations? This is again where I think we can get some inspirations from design practices. In UI design, people have developed many production-oriented evaluation methods. These methods take from information science research and theories, but translate them into something accessible and actionable. And one of the methods is known as heuristic evaluation. Heuristics literally means to discover. It's a way to solve problems by self-discovery and rule of thumb, when there's no systemic, absolute, best answer. There is no way to say which kind of design is the best, but there are some common rules of thumb that many designers believe give good designs. 
Heuristic evaluation compares designs against these recommended principles like prevent errors or keep the interface minimal. A user should always have some undo option, and the interfaces shouldn't be cluttered to the point that they cannot quickly find what they need. In a sense, accessibility standards like bigger font sizes, image alt text for screen readers, higher color contrast, etc. are also heuristic principles. One of the most used set of principles is called nuisance heuristics from Danish HCI researcher Jacob Nielsen. The two principles, error prevention and minimal list design I just mentioned, are both from Nielsen's heuristics. It's published in 2005 and still in wide use today. You can find it as browser plugins like US Checks and Chrome, and as evaluation templates such as this one on Figma. Web accessibility heuristics also come as pre-made tools, like this one called WAVE, Web Accessibility Evaluation, from Utah State University. Outside UI design, there are many works with similar approaches as heuristics, sometimes in the shape of best practices, good practices, recommendations, codes of ethics, or just principles. So for example, here are some codes of ethics from journalism, talking about how to do good reporting. The codes cover principles like minimizing harm, protecting privacy, avoiding conflicts of interest and corruption, welcoming criticism and competition, and presenting diverse points of view. There are also recommendations and strategies for community-based actions against misinformation, like this one. Here's another example called Femfesto, an initiative in scholar communications, part of school libraries. And these principles are for library policymaking, like using inclusive languages, including communities in the decision-making process, and repatriating materials back to the communities. Similarly, working with feminist principles, data feminism, gives seven principles that guide us to critically examine and investigate data around us. And this report on AAPI anti-racism comes from Stop AAPI Hate, a coalition between community organizations and academic departments. In this report, they make policy recommendations like funding community partnerships, formalizing language access, improving civil rights data reporting, addressing bias-motivated harassment, etc and there are suggestions for researchers and founders as well. These reports, codes, principles, and recommendations are not exactly the same as UI heuristics, but they are using very similar approaches. When we cannot solve an entire problem with a single solution, at least we can have some common grounds to start collaborating. We can agree that works following these principles usually turn out better, so we use these principles to check and guide our future works. So, we are facing some complex grand problems in our times, and there is no panacea to solve all the problems, or even just one problem. You cannot redesign a system and expect that we will undo all the previous harms, nor can you find one heuristic that will guide all the works towards perfection. Still, these are useful tools, and they will open up spaces and possibilities. Combining them with theories and methods from information science, we can make things happen. Maybe let's call these practices our lines of flight. Our spaces of leakage, rupture, distancing, and reflection that allow us to diverge even just a little bit from the pipeline flows of the society. These lines of flight are what I hope to create in this course. At the end of it, I hope you have found those lines for yourself and gained some power to follow them. I hope you can now take another look at things and do something different, to re-examine things around you and to make new things happen. Again, everything I'm introducing here can be an entire research field, and companies, institutions, or even community organizations can feel distant at times. But I hope this class shortens the distance between you and the big thoughts and actions happening out there. So that will conclude our entire course. This is Ling Yu. I hope you stay informed and stay well. Peace.